it up. We've got our next talk from Alessandro Molina, who will be telling us about um, moving away from Node.js and onto Python. Um, if you could all welcome him, there will be a chance for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. First, I would like to start by telling you why I decided to have this talk because I know that probably many of you are already using a solution to transform and manage their assets. Probably you have been using it with success for months, year, I don't know. And probably in that solution, Node.js is involved in many ways, at least to run the tools that perform the translation or the uh, transpilers themselves or whatever. But I know that many people approach the solution that they are using today for the reason that they don't know there are other ways to do that. Most people have been, have been doing that that way. If you look on Google or wherever how to do that, the first result is probably how to do that with Node.js. And so people have been approaching that kind of solution mostly because that's the way you are meant to do it. But there are actually very good alternatives that can solve also the problem of having to cope with two different languages. I know for sure that anyone in this room is a Python programmer, but I'm not sure that everyone in this room also is as proficient with JavaScript or Node.js or whatever. So having to maintain two different environments with their dependencies, different tools, different package managers, and install both of them on your at least development environment, if not even on the production environment, is not always what you want to do. So let's talk about something that probably happened in the life of every one of us, which is that you've been able to start your project using Python for everything. Your web framework is probably Python-based. You serve your API or even your web page through it you are able to run it using a Python-based solution that you can write plugins for using Python. So you, we can deploy it using supervisors, Circus, MicroWhiskey, Gevent, WhatWhiskey, whatever you're using that it's probably comfortable because you know you can go into the code and have a pretty good grasp of what's happening or write plugins for it and extend its behavior and so on. You're probably also deploying it using a tool like Salt, Ansible, or Docker Compose, which are in Python too. And you probably monitor the state of your application using a tool like Sentry, Datadog, Backlash, which have all Python agents. Some of them even have backend code written in Python, and so on. So we are finally able to do everything we want by going into the Python code, messing with it, extending its behavior, doing whatever we want in our stack. And that's only not true for the assets part, because one day you probably go on holiday, you come back and the front-end guy introduces a whole new language, whole new dependency manager, a whole <laughs> new set of things in the project, which now need to be installed through NPM, through having a new interpreter on your system, and things like that. Which is not bad, because Node.js actually has a really good set of tools for doing this as a good set of transpilers, as most of them transpile to JavaScript and have been written by the JavaScript community, have been written, of course, in Node.js itself. They has a good set of tools to automate testing of your JavaScript parts and front-end parts, and there's a good set of tools to automate tasks, like, uh, for example, Grant and Gulp which are actually made to do that job and provide pipelines that transform your assets and things like that. So the side effect of this is that while it's a great tool and has everything you usually need, you now need to have a package manager to manage the package managers because you have need to be sure that in the environment you are working on, you will have both PIP or the pre-made wheels if you use the uh, binary distribution. You need to make sure you have NPM to be able to set up the working environment from scratch, at least on your continuous integration or on the uh, developer's machines and so on. 
So you will need a tool that installs both of those. In most simple cases, it might be just a app get itself. In more complex cases, you might want to provide something like an Ansible script to actually deploy the working environment. Um, then you have two different places where you need to be sure to update your dependencies because we will have the dependency for NPM and we will have the dependencies for PIP. And in the most simple case, two different people work on the two different parts of the system and they update each one their own dependencies. But in some cases, there might be features that cross through the bridge of the two parts and you might need to be sure that to make the front end of, your, of the new functionality you added, you will need to add the dependency in both places and have the client and server side dependency of your functionality and make sure that they get installed both, otherwise your feature won't work as expected at all. So you will probably end up adding a third solution on top of all of these to actually manage this complexity. And there are many and so far there is not really a standard de facto to rely on. I mean, you can probably try to achieve this by using Ansible for everything. You can probably try to achieve this by doing pre-configured Docker images. You can actually try to solve the solution many different problems. But it's actually a problem that you should not need to solve because uh, it's been introduced for a purpose that in most cases can be solved without introducing the new technology that is actually triggering our problem with different stacks and dependencies. And there are pretty good frameworks in Python to manage assets. One of them is actually web assets, which has been the one that I preferred over the long run because it provides a really simple interface. You can configure it both through an API and through uh, simple YAML files, and it provides also the front-end part of your assets. Whenever you need to use an asset, you can actually use it from, uh, by importing it in, from web assets. So it will also take care of things like cache, cache busting and things like that for you. So it can replace solutions like Grunt and Gulp in performing the transformation of your assets because much like them works as a pipeline. So it gets some kind of input, which is usually a file, and then up providing another output, which is usually a file itself, which will be the file transpiled, your CSS converted, or your images are scaled, and things like that. And the advantage of using this approach is that if you need something, if you need support for scaling images, if you need support for compiling less, if you need support for SAS or whatever, you just track the dependency in your setup UI because the less compiler for web assets is just a Python package, like web assets itself. So if you need less, you don't have to remember that you have a step to run before your application. So you don't have to remember that you need to perform NPM install. You don't have to remember that you need to run grant. You can actually make everything automatic through Python by having your application that when it's installed, it will install the support for less. And when it starts, it will automatically provide, compile the assets uh, without having to actually provide yourself a solution to do that. And it actually works with any WSGI framework. So you can even use it as a, a middleware around your framework, which doesn't care about the template language and the framework you are using and allows you to manage your assets independently for the framework, even if you use a plain whiskey application without a framework at all. <laughs> and as I told you, it's actually providing a uh, HTML side API to inject the resources, which is good because in many other cases, when you inject the resource you generate it through maybe grant or gold. You will have to provide to to provide the solution for things like cache busting yourself. So in case the resource changed, in case you update a CSS file, you want the browser to load the new updated version and not keep using the old one just because the browser has it in cache. And usually this is something you might need to 
provide yourself, maybe by adding a timestamp to all the URLs or things like that. But Web Assets does it for you. So when it generates a hash of your resource, and whenever the resource changes, the hash will change. And so the new resource will have a totally different URL. And as you inject them to an API, it will inject the latest URL every time you run your template language. And the way you define your resources in Web Assets is actually through bundles. So a bundle is actually any kind of resource. It can even be a, res a bundle made of just one single thing if you need to translate like your single CSS file from SAS to CSS, you can create a bundle with single file inside. And the bundle is defined as a, something that has a name. In this case, we have two bundles, style and JSOL. And each bundle might have a filter, which for the first case is CSS utils, uh, which is used to minify the CSS. And we'll have a, an output, which in this case, for simplicity, is just a file I've coded. So uh, everything inside the bundle will be minified and squashed into that style.css file. And actually, you can have content, which can even be a bundle itself, because you can see a point where we have a content uh, sub-entry uh, which uh, has SCSS files inside and provides a different filter, which is libsas, which is used to convert SCSS to CSS, of course. And libsas itself is a Python package, so you can actually just add it to your setup UI and have everything managed through your package manager. So what happens is when our system will need the style bundle, it will actually end up compiling, performing all the transformation for the nested bundles. Like in this case, it will start by transpiling all the SAS files to, S to CSS files. And then it will up perform the upper part, which in this case is the CSS utils filters on all the files we specified and on the result of the previous bundle. And we will end up with a single style.css file, which inside has all that CSS files, all our SCSS files transpiled by libsas, and the result is then minified too. And the same happens for JSOL, which actually in this case applies to JS mean filter, which as you can imagine performs minification of JavaScript. And it will get all these files and we'll squash them into dependencies.js and we'll minify them, of course. And to use them in from your front end, it's actually pretty simple as uh, web assets will provide you with an environment that has knowledge about all the bundles you created in the configuration. And you can uh, just inject the resources through this environment. In my example, the environment is owned by the global uh, application object, uh, which is that G uh, object you see there. And what's happening is that, that I just create, uh, I loop on all the resources um, of the style bundle and create a new link entry for each CSS resource. You might be asking why I loop as I actually declare the single bundle name style, so there should be only one. And the reason why I loop is that actually if you run web assets in debug mode, you won't perform the minification and squashing anymore. So you can debug your resources separated, and then when you are sure that things work as you expect, you turn debug mode off and you end up having a single resource. So with this syntax, you are sure that everything works, both when you run in the back and production mode, so both when you have a single or multiple resources uh, generated by web assets. And the same happens for the JS all bundle, because I just loop through all the URLs provided for the JS all bundle, and I inject a script tag for that. So in this case, the example is made using the Kajiki template engine, or the Genshi one, the syntax is the same actually. But it works in any template language. If you look at the web assets site, 
you will find examples in uh, Jinja and so on. But we didn't really remove the problem totally because still, for some more complex filters, we will need to have Node.js available. For example, if I want to convert my ES6 code to ES5 to JavaScript that the browser is actually able to run, I will probably need to bring in something like Babel. And Babel actually is implemented in Node.js, so I will need to install Node.js and tell uh, web assets where it can find the Babel executable file which is actually not really good in my opinion because I didn't really solve anything. If I need to have Node.js to perform the bubble, to run Bubble, at that point it makes sense to just have Node.js for everything and don't have to actually have parts of my assets pipeline on one side and parts of my assets pipeline on the other side. And that's the point of this talk actually. What I wanted to do is solve these problem, not having to rely on Node.js at all in my Python environment. And that's why I created DuckPy. And DuckPy is actually a replacement for Node.js in many ways. It's specifically meant for assets management, so you won't be writing web application on top of DuckPy. It doesn't have the concept of any or request. It doesn't have a server inside. It's just a JavaScript interpreter. We built teams transpiler for the most common environments and most common languages and things like that. So we can now just add DuckPy as a dependency of our setup file in our requirements. And we know that whenever we need something that relies on JavaScript, we just have DuckPy installed without having to have some external tool taking care of installing it and so on because it's just a Python package. And there is a Python package which actually has no external dependencies. DuckPy itself comes uh, self-contained, and it, the only need, thing you will need is a C compiler, because currently there is no uh, binary distribution, mostly until will support for Linux environment is totally clear how it should uh, work in a reliable way. Currently, but the C dependency itself doesn't use any C library apart from libc. So as far as you have GCC installed, you don't need anything else to actually install and compile DuckPy. So you just run pip install, and you will end up with DuckPy installed and working. And the reason why I created it is that because I wasn't really satisfied with the other existing solutions, because like PyExec.js, PyDemonkey, V8, and so on for Python require external tools like V8 and SpiderMonkey. And it's, really, it's usually really hard to build those. I don't know if any one of you ever tried to build SpiderMonkey, but it's something we spent like two days only trying to get a binary that runs and works. So it's not really easy to have them integrated in your install and build process. And DuckPy is also explicitly tailored for web development, so it means that most things you will need are probably built into DuckPy to make your assets pipeline in Python itself. A simple example is actually compiling CoffeeScript. So I don't need to install anything, because in DuckPy itself there is the CoffeeScript compiler built in. So I just import DuckPy, run the coffee compile function, and I get the, coffee, the JavaScript generated out of that coffee script. And you should notice that this is not something that will have major problems or that might not be compatible and so on, because it's not a coffee script compiler implemented in Python. It's actually the real coffee script compiler in JavaScript itself that it's running on top of DuckPy. So whenever the CoffeeScript compiler is updated with a bug fix, new release, new support for la language or whatever, it will be just a matter of replacing a JavaScript file, maybe fixing two or three things inside that file, and the new release of that file will have support with that, for that without major issues. And the same applies for Bubble. I can convert my ECMAScript 6 to plain JavaScript just by calling the Bubble compile function and you see that I get out a plain JavaScript out of my uh, class declared in ECMAScript 6. And also for TypeScript, 
So you can actually create Angular to web application using DuckPy and no need for Node.js at all. I actually did it for real, this. So you can declare your application, your class in TypeScript and compile it and you will get the compiled JavaScript out of it. And as I told you, AngularJS 2 perfectly works on top of DuckPy. So this actually solved the problem of compiling and transpiling my resource, my most complex resources. For, for simple things, I can use web assets, which already provides all the filters I need usually. And for more complex things like transpiling, TypeScript, ECMAScript, and so on, I can rely on DuckPy, which provides the filters or web assets itself. So I can just import from the DuckPy the filter for TypeScript, import from DuckPy the filter for Rubble.js, register them into web assets, and from that point on, I will have support for TypeScript or Bubble.js inside my bundles. So in this case, you can see, for example, that I added a bunch of ECMAScript 6 files, which are compiled, minified into the JS app bundle, and that's declared by the fact that they use the Bubble.js filter, which is provided by DuckPy. And you don't only stop there. You don't even need NPM anymore because DuckPy has a package manager for NPM.org built in. So if you need to have a JavaScript dependency in your Python program, you can just use DuckPy.installJS package, specify the uh, name of the package, the version that you want to install, and if you want, it's optional the directory where you want to install it. By default, it will install it inside the JS vendor directory of your uh, web application, which is from the environment of web assets. And it also will install any dependency of the package. So if your package, if your JavaScript package has dependencies itself, it will end up installing them all too. And if you mix these with the setup tools, which have a setup requires function, you can tell that your web application setups requires DuckPy and have all the JavaScript dependencies installed by setup tools itself. So when you do pip install my web app, you get all your Python and JavaScript dependencies installed without the need of any external dependency manager. And the only thing you should notice is that DuckPy is not full of features as the NPM original one. So for example, in case of a collision, it, in case two different packages requires two different versions of a package which collide, which are not supported one by the other, that Pi currently will just take the newest one. So it will take for granted that the newest one should work with both of them, but will not make more advanced things like filtering on the minor version and things like that. So in some cases, if you only specify the high level dependency, you might end up with collagen dependency installed, but that's something you can solve by just specifying the precise version for each dependency you want to have. I plan to extend this behavior by providing full dependency resolution, collision and version resolutions because it, Dependency resolution is already provided, but the collision part is not. And, but currently has not been a major issue for me because I tend just to specify the precise version of each of my dependencies to make sure that the software is always reinstallable even in 10 years from now. And one really interesting thing is that DuckPy is compatible on Node.js also for the requirements of packages. So DuckPy provides a require function which is able to import Node.js packages. And that makes possible to use something like React to render your script from server side code in Python. So we can actually create isomorphic web application in Python alone without the need to mess with Node.js anymore because we can just render the isomorphic part, the part that uses React, from our Python code by using duckpy.js compile and running then the uh, render to static markup code, which will render the React component 
to plain markup, inject this markup into our template, and have a React from the client side continue from the markup we generated. Actually, if you want client side React to continue from the markup we created from the server, you should be uh, using render to string instead of render to static markup. But that doesn't matter. You just switch the function name and things work. So you can provide the first version of your web page rendered from the server uh, so the user sees the result instantly. And then the client side library kicks in and continues from there without any problem. Because we actually run the real React, React code from our server. And not only that, if you need to export your Python code from, from Python, of course, and make it available inside JavaScript, as you can call JavaScript from Python, we can actually call Python from JavaScript. We just use the export function uh, feature of uh, DuckPy. And in this case, we export the sorted function, which is built in into Python and sorts whatever iterable you throw at it and we export it as sort number. So inside JavaScript, we will, have, we will be able to call it using call Python sort numbers and passing the numbers that should be sorted. And we will get back as the result, of course, the sorted numbers. And also, you don't have to care about um, references to the objects and memory management, because uh, there is a choice I made, which is to pass everything by value. So every value you pass back and forth from Python to JavaScript is actually copied. It's not the original object itself. This allows much simpler uh, resolution of problems in memory management or references, and you won't end up with uh, leaking dangling pointers in Python because some code in JavaScript is leaking memory, which needs support in which needs a Python object. As leaking memory in JavaScript is pretty easy sometimes. But that one actually uh, do anything to your Python code because the objects you pass back and forth are copies and are not the original object. So this actually did everything I needed. And I was really happy with that Pi as a solution because I could actually manage all my dependencies from setup UI without the need to maintain NPM or an external tool that maintains both NPM and PIP. And I could perform all the transpiling in Python, so if I needed to add a feature or change something in my transpiler, I could just mess up with Python code. And DuckPy actually has been a quite performing solution for me. Uh, I would say you should not use it on production because there is a lot of C code. I mean, not on production. You should not use it in the live running web application. You should it, use it during the uh, packaging of the web application because there is a lot of C code inside. I cannot guarantee that it won't crash with a segmentation fault while handling 2,000 requests a second and things like that. But for everything that is related to packaging and building the resources and so on, it always worked without any problem for me so far. The bugs that I found have been solved pretty quickly, and it's been like an, a few months that I have been using it without finding any new bug. So if you want to try it, feel free to. DuckPy actually works for practically any used version of Python, from 2.6 to 3.5. And if you find any bug, feel free to open the issue on GitHub because it's totally open source. It's fully tested. I guarantee there is 100 coverage on all the DuckPy code. And I have examples that ensure that all the transpilers are still working whenever I update the JavaScript side code of everything. And to use it, you just have to pip install it and have fun with it. So thank you. If you have any questions. So this is really awesome. Uh, thanks very much for, sh for showing this off. Uh, have you ever had any experience uh, using it for things like Ember CLI, uh, which is more opinionated? 
No, never tried with the Ember. I tried with the Angular 2 and React only. You feel free to try it. If you find any issue, send me an email. I try to solve it. Thanks very much. It's very cool to not have to run Node.js on my web server. So thank you for that. Uh, do you know if uh, your project will work with uh, the less CSS uh, compiler, transpiler? Uh, it should. I didn't try it on DuckPy cell because you have a less compiler for uh, web assets. So when I mostly use SAS, but uh, I know there is the less compiler for web assets itself, so it never came to my mind uh, in my need. But it, it should be a matter of just loading the JS file of the less compiler running it with DuckPy and see if it does what you expect. Usually it does. The only problem you might face is with regular expressions because DuckPy up actually applies the JavaScript standard more tightly than Node.js. So some syntaxes that Node.js consider valid in regular expression that are actually not, DuckPy will tell you, hey, this is not valid. You need to escape this part of the regular expression. But as far as it's a matter of fixing the two free regular expression and the code, we usually just work. Thank you very much. A semi-related question. Have you investigated at all the state of pure Python JavaScript interpreters? Uh, mm, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that's it's a complex. That's a complex question because, yes, I did uh, like a year ago. Uh, I tried to use some of them, but I'm not sure. At least a year ago, none of them could actually be so resilient to make sure that you throw a Node.js library to it and it will just work. For example, DuckPy uh, has, I invested pretty much some time into providing a compatible support for the required function to make sure that the node dependencies, resolution, and so on works exactly the same as Node.js. And so I did it. I did it some time ago, so it might be that the situation changed. I don't know the case, but I just wanted to know the answer. OK, yeah. All right, I think that was our last question. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you.